Just before we get started today, I want to talk to you about something that's going to save you some serious cash. Now I know, people often look for ways to save money, especially when it comes to travel. And did you know that by using a VPN, you could potentially save hundreds of dollars on your holiday bookings? That's where today's sponsor NordVPN comes in. They're the VPN provider that are going to help you save money on your travel bookings. So here's how it works. NordVPN allows you to connect to a server in a different country, so you can access lower prices that are not available in your own country. Flights, car rentals, accommodation, ferries, and even theme parks can cost significantly less if booked from outside of the customer's home country. That means you could save a lot of money on your next vacation. But not all VPN providers are created equal. You need to make sure you choose a reliable VPN that takes your privacy and security seriously. And that's why I recommend Nord. They offer next generation encryption and a kill switch to make sure that your data is never exposed. And that's not all. NordVPN also has a threat protection feature that protects you from ads, web trackers, and malware, and dark web monitoring that notifies you if someone leaks your credentials. NordVPN is compatible with all major platforms, including Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS, and it can be used on six devices simultaneously. Not only that, it also enables you to bypass geo restrictions and access a wider range of online content. And right now, NordVPN is offering a special deal for you, my viewers. If you go to nordvpn.com slash TIFO, you can get a two-year plan plus four months for free. And the best part is that it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to save money on your travel bookings and protect your privacy and security, get NordVPN today. And now, today's video. A certain narrowly mustachioed political leader in 20th century Germany had some very clear ideas on how to educate children and young adults. In his own words, my program for educating youth is hard. Weakness must be hammered away. A youth will grow up before which the world will tremble. I want a brutal, domineering, fearless, cruel youth. As per their typical characteristics, young Germans were thus ideally as swift as a greyhound, as tough as leather, and as hard as Krupp steel. Such was the ideology behind the creation of the Hitler Youth. Like other Nazi party organizations, it was an invasive, pervasive, and persuasive force, and it was one of the most important to Hitler's goals for the nation. The man himself stated in 1935, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. At its peak, the Hitler Youth counted more than 7 million children aged 10 to 18 whose hearts and minds had been shaped by constant indoctrination, propaganda, and military-like drills. But how did this movement first emerge and become one of the largest and most recognizable institutions within the Third Reich? And for that matter, what was it actually like to be in the Hitler Youth, and what did they get up to in the various stages of the rise of the Nazis and then later during World War II? Well, to begin with, youth movements were particularly pervasive in late 19th century and early 20th century Germany. The first movement of note was known as Van der Vogel, a loose organization of boys and young men who advocated a simple lifestyle close to nature. They rejected industrialization. They hiked in shorts and boots. They also loved to sing old folk songs around campfires and greeted each other by shouting Heil. As the von der Vogel grew in popularity in the early 1900s, they attracted the attention of more mainstream political and religious groups who created their own competing youth groups. Following Germany's defeat in World War I, paramilitary organizations became all the rage, especially amongst the more extreme parties within the political spectrum. The paramilitarization of society influenced a new wave of youth movements, such as the Young socialist young democrats and young conservatives who adopted military-style uniforms and ranks. All of them, however, shared a common theme, an idealistic longing to usher in a new prosperous era for a defeated Germany. In 1920, a former Austrian corporal rebranded the small German Workers' Party as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis to you and me. As he took control of the party, Adolf Hitler sanctioned the formation of a youth league under the direction of his SA, or brown shirts. In March of 1922, the Nazi newspaper Volkischer Beobachter launched a recruitment drive calling for all young Germans between 14 and 18 years of age whose hearts are affected by the suffering and hardships afflicting the fatherlands to join the ranks of the fighters against the Jewish enemy, the sole originator of our present shame and suffering. Lovely stuff. The organization's rules emphasized love of one's country and people, fair enough, enjoyment of honest open combat and of healthy physical activity. Sure, many boys like that, and exercise is good for everybody. Veneration of ethical and spiritual values, hard to disagree with that one, and the rejection of those <laughs> and the rejection of those values originating from Jewry. And I mean, maybe this is going to sound crazy, but maybe not that one. <laughs> 
In any event, early recruits of the party's youth league were expected to attend weekly meetings dedicated to political lectures and ideological indoctrination. Two Sundays a month, the boys could enjoy some open-air activity by taking mandatory hiking trips across the countryside, no doubt rocking their lederhosen. The first leader of the youth league was one Gustav Lenk, a 19-year-old piano polisher who tried to increase membership by founding local chapters in Germany's major cities. His efforts were brought to a halt on November 9, 1923, when Hitler and the Nazis attempted a coup in Munich, but their plans failed miserably. Much of the Nazi leadership was subsequently arrested, the party was disbanded, and so was its youth league. As for the young Lenk, he also served time, and upon his release in December 1924, he broke away from the Nazi party, creating a separate nationalist youth movement. This did not sit well with party leadership, who discredited Lenk by accusing him of treason and petty theft. Hitler then resurrected the youth league, now rebranded the Greater German Youth Movement under the leadership of 21-year-old law student Kurt Gruber, who oh, we can't even tell you how much we wish had been named Hans. It was Gruber who introduced this organization's distinctive uniform, including black shorts, brown shirts, and swastika armbands. And it was him who, on July the 4th, 1925, changed the organization's name to Hitler Youth. Membership for this one was open to boys aged 14 to 18, and ultimately the numbers began to rise rapidly, with over 5,000 at this point. As the organization grew, it also became more expensive to sustain. As such, Gruber imposed a monthly membership fee of four pfennigs, and ordered his Hitler youths to stage frequent propaganda marches to collect donations. In 1928, the Hitler youth had doubled in size again, reaching 10,000 members. At the end of this year, Gruber also reorganized the structure of the Hitler youth, adding a new department for boys aged 10 to 14, called Jungvolk, or young people. He also established two branches for girls, the Young Girls for those aged 10 to 14 and the League of German Girls for ages 14 to 18, known by the German acronym BDM. Gruber also founded the Hitler Youth's own news service, dedicated to writing propaganda newspapers for young readers and opposing to quote the Jewish monopoly of news. This brings us to mid-1928. With the organization flourishing, Gruber was doing well, too well maybe, and he attracted the competition of the 21-year-old leader of the Nazi Student Association and future Reich governor of Vienna, Balder von Schirach. Gruber realized that Schirach was gunning for his job, and thus made extra efforts to suck up to the Führer. For example, in September 1929, 2,000 Hitler youths marched at a Nuremberg party rally, greatly impressing Hitler himself. At this point, the movement now counted 450 branches and 13,000 members. Things hit a bit of a snag, however, when in March of 1930, following a Hitler Youth rally, German authorities actually forbade schoolboys from joining Hitler Youth. The result of telling a bunch of teenagers they couldn't do something predictably saw Hitler Youth's numbers soar to almost 64,000 shortly after the ban. At this point, Hitler placed the organization under the direct control of Ernst Rom, chief of staff of the brown shirted SA, making Gruber a direct subordinate of Rom's. Moreover, Gruber still had to contend with the attacks from that pesky Schirach, who accused the Hitler Youth leader of botching fundraising efforts. Rom doubled down on the criticism, accusing Gruber of poor recruitment. Finally, in October of 1931, the Nazi party announced they had accepted Gruber's resignation. And the fact that he had allegedly never submitted it is uh, neither here nor there. Whatever the case there, it was now Schirach's time to shine. A directive issued by Hitler on October the 30th appointed Schirach as the new Reich Youth leader in charge of all youth and student associations. The Führer could count on Schirach's total blind obedience and loyalty. He was in fact known for describing Hitler as the genius gazing at the stars. He also stated that loyalty is everything and everything is the love of Adolf Hitler. And more! We do not need intellectual leaders who create new ideas because the superimposing leader of all desires of youth is Adolf Hitler. We can safely say from all of this that the hue of his nose closely matched the hue of his brown shirt. Chirac installed a similarly strong sense of loyalty among his young troops. As to what the Hitler youth were getting up to at this relatively early point, the leaders organized frequent overnight camping trips during which the boys learned Nazi slogans and anthems. Also on a weekly basis, they were expected to attend home evenings, which were essentially indoctrination meetings run according to tightly defined agendas. The relentless propaganda appeared successful as Hitler youths were overeager to canvas and campaign for the Nazi party throughout 1931 and 1932. Much of these activities were limited to marching around while distributing leaflets, but fist fights or even gunfights with communist youth groups were frequent, with a couple of dozen Hitler youths killed in these street battles. 
But the Hitler Youth really rose to prominence after January the 30th, 1933, when Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. The Enabling Act in March gave him full dictatorial powers, paving the way for Nazification of the state. A couple of months later, in April, Chirac took control or eliminated all 400 competing youth organizations. Overnight, Hitler Youth membership exploded from about 100,000 to almost 3 million. Following this up, on June the 17th, 1933, Chirac was appointed Youth Leader of Germany, which made him answerable only to Hitler and placed all youth activities into his hands. Under his leadership, millions of German boys and girls were kept constantly busy on a variety of activities. Boys, in particular, were subjected to a regimen of rigorous physical exercise. They practiced sports such as track and field, cross-country running, boxing, jiu-jitsu, and something called club throwing. Basically, they competed in throwing wooden clubs as far as possible. Clubs, we should probably mention, which had a suspicious resemblance to the potato masher hand grenades used by the army. Other physical games included Trapper and Indian, a variation of hide-and-seek, and night fights in which small Jungvolk boys rode atop their older Hitler Youth comrades, staging mock horse races and jousts. War games were also very popular, in which opposing teams had to hunt their enemies and rip off their armbands. These mock battles often degenerated into vicious brawls encouraged by the older instructors. Now, you may have spotted a theme here. All activities were designed to instill combat readiness and a martial mindset. In fact, by 1935, rifle practice with live rounds had become widespread because, I mean, what could go wrong with giving kids guns and instilling a good sense of real hatred of certain of their fellow men? All in all, if you were a vigorous teenager in 1930s Germany, you likely would have enjoyed the Hitler Youth's training regimen. After the war, former members recalled how the Hitler Youth gave them a sense of belonging and comradeship, provided them with a home away from home, and tore them away from the boredom of classrooms to indulge in exciting open-air battles. Of course, the youths were expected to attend lengthy indoctrination sessions on Nazi ideology and racial pseudoscience. As for this, former members recall these as being devastatingly boring sessions, which no one really cared about, though they were seemingly effective nonetheless. Another fun activity for the Hitler Youth was, as of 1934, the more radicalized members could apply to join the Steifendienst, or Patrol Force, the Hitler Youth's own internal police force. Their task was to maintain order at meetings, identify disloyal members, and even infiltrate rival youth movements which were still operating clandestinely. More than anything else, Patrol Force troopers reported any critics of Hitler and Nazi ideology, sometimes ratting out their own parents. For example, one unlucky father, Mr. Herz, dared to call Hitler a crazed maniac. His son, Walter, promptly denounced him, and his father was then sent to Dachau concentration camp. Freaking kids, man! As perhaps should come as no surprise as they came of age, the patrol force troopers were targeted for recruitment by the SS, and many entered the Junker Schule, or SS officer academies, while many more joined the ranks of the Death's Hand units guarding concentration camps. So, just catching up, Hitler youth boys during the 1930s were extremely skilled at throwing clubs, punching each other, ratting out anyone who dared speak out against Hitler, and great at singing songs about their God-given right to dump on non-Aryans. For example, one popular ditty went, When the Jewish blood splashes from the knives, things will go twice as well. Now, we should also at this point discuss education. You see, over the years, the Hitler youth had become the main institution responsible for educating German minors. But let's just say, while teaching children the essential life skills of hating Jews and throwing hand grenades was arguably unparalleled in any education system in the world in the Hitler Youth, they didn't do such a good job with other things like such useless educational staples like reading or writing or arithmetic. On this note, time in classrooms was largely spent learning about the Nazis' rise to power, the miracles Hitler was pulling off, alleged Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracies, and general propaganda. This all to no time was dedicated to advancing a standard curriculum in topics such as maths, literature, or science, or at least not in the traditional sense. As noted by a July 1941 timepiece, history is fed to boys as a story of the great German destiny. Mathematics is taught in terms of bullet trajectories, range finding, sextant reading, aerodynamics. As members of the Hitler Youth, the little leader geniuses uh, searched for the qualities every German warrior must have. Punctuality, orderliness, reliability, subordination, gregariousness, adaptability, diligence, willpower, aggressiveness, acute sensory perception, practical talents. Each boy's record is tabulated, analyzed, and filed away so that his complete case history of character development will be available for the future use of army psychologists. On that note, pupils over 12 whose Nazi credentials were particularly shining could join one of 10 elite Adolf Hitler schools. Once graduated, they could enroll in one of the Ordensurgen, or Order Castles. After a further three years course, they could aspire to join top positions in the Nazi party. 
Speaking of older kids, until 1936, most of the attention had to be paid to children aged 12 or above. But Chirac declared 1936 to be the year of the Jungvolk, or young people, his goal being to enroll every single suitable 10-year-old in the country into this movement. Hitler lent him a hand by issuing a decree in December by mandating that all Germans aged 10 and above should join the young people. Jews and other such undesirables, of course, were excluded. But sometimes, somehow, some slipped through the net. For example, in 1937, at the age of 10, Robert Middleman was forced to join the young people. Decades later, he recalled how he enjoyed outdoor activities, sports, the sense of camaraderie, and even the strict discipline. But the education curriculum, all centered on Hitler, the glory of the Reich, and the annihilation of the undesirables, sent shivers down his spine. The issue for young Robert was although he appeared a pure Aryan stock, his biological father was actually not just a Jew, but a Polish Jew. Doubling down on the deadly fun, his parents were also secretly communists, who had helped hide or to escape many opponents of the Nazi regime. As for Robert, he kept up the facade of the good Hitler Youth Trooper for his and his family's safety while carrying out acts of resistance in secret. For example, he snuck food and vital information to Jewish families in hiding. At the age of 15, his acts became even more daring, having linked up with another half-Jewish boy and then hung posters reading, Down with Hitler. We only wish they'd followed it up with a classic Jews rule Hitler drools. In any event, though, while he may not have penned that one, he burned down a Hitler Youth office. <laughs> so there's that. Others were more excited to join the Jungvolk. Not so much for ideological reasons, but just because of the adventure of it. As noted by former members Alphonse Hack in 1985, far from being forced to enter the ranks of the Jungvolk, I could barely contain my impatience and was, in fact, accepted before I was quite ten. It seemed like an exciting life, free from parental supervision vision filled with duties that seemed sheer pleasure. These, on the whole, he describes mirrored in many ways that of the Boy Scouts and other such organizations for those of the male persuasion. And as for the girls, they would likewise be training in various ways, only in their case doing such things as learning to take care of and organize home life and stay in peak physical condition, including gymnastics, running, swimming, in order to someday produce healthy Nazi babies and raise them on Nazi ideology. Unfortunately, in the years following the December 1936 decree, Hitler Youth faced another threat boredom. You see, when membership became compulsory and almost six million youngsters joined the Nazi youth organizations, morale and discipline plummeted. And when literally everyone is doing it to boot, well, they lose interest. Who knew? Chirac's solution to this problem was simply to begin to ramp up the boys' outdoor activities. No doubt closing his eyes and throwing a dart at a dartboard of outdoor activity ideas, the specific ones he chose just happened to be ones mirroring proper soldier training. And so it was that in 1937, Chirac launched a paramilitary program for Hitler Youth boys for no particular reason that we can think of. About 1.5 million of them were thus formally trained in marksmanship and took part in military-style field exercises. Youths could also join special formations aligned to three armed forces. In the Flieger Hitler Youth, run by the Luftwaffe, boys learned how to build and fly gliders. In the Motor Formation, youths aged 16 and above learned to drive cars and motorbikes. And in the Marine Unit, Hitler Youths learned how to sail and joined the Kriegsmarine for naval exercises. Just good old-fashioned family fun. As older Hitler youths learned how to wage war, the line between them and other paramilitary formations of the Reich became increasingly blurred, including in their activities outside the program. For example, in November of 1938, Heinrich Himmler's SS troops orchestrated and unleashed a brutal anti-Semitic pogrom Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass. This occurred on the night of November the 9th and into the morning of the next day. On this one, in a nutshell, the Nazis coordinated a widespread wave of aggression against the Jews. The idea was to make it look like the general public was just fed up with the Jews and acting on it, when in fact orders from the top came down that the SS, SA, and even the Hitler Youth were to basically riot around Jewish communities. In the end, hundreds of synagogues were burned and vandalized, and countless Jewish-owned businesses and homes suffered the same fate. All the while, firefighters and police were instructed to stand aside and let it happen. Doubling down on the awful, the next day approximately 30,000 Jews were arrested and sent to places like the Dachau concentration camp. The general point of it all seems to have been in line with simply trying to convince the Jews to leave the country in various brutal ways. On this one, those arrested whose families could show proof that they would be leaving the country soon seem to have been released without issue. In any event, as for the Hitler Youth joining the fun, it appears many did so spontaneously and enthusiastically without explicit orders from the top. In fact, Chirac opposed such outbreaks of violence. Following the event, he called for a meeting of all local group leaders and forbade them from participating in similar violent actions in the future. And speaking of violent actions, as you might imagine, things for Hitler Youth took a turn in September of 1939 when violence became the norm across Europe and the world. 
According to Hitler, of course, because the Jews had a desire for world war. However, and you guys are probably not going to believe this one, but in retrospect, it seems that it might have been Hitler who started the war. As for the Hitler Youth, first and foremost, most of them aged 18 and above were drafted into the armed forces. And if you're wondering on this one, while Hitler Youth membership was formally restricted to 14 to 18 year olds, several squad and local leaders were aged up to 24. Thus, the draft left most squads leaderless, and boys aged 16 to 17 were promoted to senior positions within the movements. Another change was the elimination of the young people, with the ranks aged 10 to 14 merged with the Hitler Youth, leaving just one organization for all age groups. The next upheaval took place at the very top. Balder von Schirak resigned from his post as leader of the Hitler Youth and joined the army. His place was taken by Arthur Axman, former head of the Hitler Youth Social Affairs Department. But the most important change was a shift in daily activities. Gone were the days of long marches and hikes, campfire songs and rough and tumble games. Now young men and women were expected to serve the home front. Initially, Hitler Youth boys were enlisted to deliver draft notices and ration cards, or collect scrap metal in their neighborhoods. BDM girls had a tougher job, helping wounded soldiers in military hospitals or assisting large families while the men were at the front. Some of these girls even worked as farm laborers and in factories. As the Wehrmacht started collecting conquests in Poland and later the Soviet Union, the Hitler Youth were used to assist the Germanification of these lands. They ensured that local families were evicted, leaving all valuables behind, and helped resettle the new tenants, ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe. When the Allies launched bombing raids on German cities, Hitler Youth Boys acted as air raid wardens or even anti-aircraft gun assistants. From January 1943, these flak batteries were officially operated by only the Hitler Youth. Boys aged 14 and below further helped their older compatriots by delivering dispatches on their bikes or operating searchlights, a very dangerous posting as they could and would be targeted by Allied bombs. As the Allied raids intensified, younger children were evacuated to Hitler Youth Children Relocation Camps, or KLVs, located mainly in East Prussia, Poland, and Slovakia. Almost 3 million boys and girls were at some point sent to one of the 5,000 KLVs where they were subjected to a harsh discipline of military drills and propaganda sessions. In such closed environments, similar to prisons, bullying and sexual abuse became widespread. Starting to get desperate, in 1943, an Allied landing on mainland Europe became very likely. As most of the manpower was deployed against the Soviet Union, Nazi leadership thus ordered the formation of an armored division composed of 16 and 17 year olds. This was the 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitler Jugend, and it attracted 10,000 volunteers to be led by 34 year old General Fritz Witt, himself a former Hitler youth. The 12th Division saw action in the weeks following the Allied landings on D Day, June 6, 1944. In July, Hitler youths offered fierce resistance against the Allies at Cannes, surprising their British and Canadian enemies with their bravery and ferocity. That said, the army of boys, however brave, was no match for the Allies, and by September, the Hitlerjürgen division was almost destroyed, with only 600 surviving troops. On the 25th of the same month, another large number of Hitler youths was conscripted into the Volkssturm, or People's Army, a militia of men aged 16 to 60. This was a desperate last-ditch attempt to keep the Western Allies and the Soviets at bay, and yet the Hitler Youth boys distinguished themselves again through their skillful use of the Panzerwaust, the infantry's anti-tank weapon. This, by the way, was partially made in the Adidas and Puma Brothers Adolf and Rudolf Dassler's factory. Much more on this in the video How the Nazis and a Family Feud Led to Adidas and Puma, available on our sister channel Highlight History. In any event, by 1945, US troops reported coming under fire from boys as little as eight years old, and young girls from the BDM had now been drafted to operate the flak batteries alongside the boys. In something of their own organizational last stand, on the 20th of April 1945, a shaking Adolf Hitler ventured out of his bunker to award the Iron Cross to a a group of 12-year-old Hitler youths who had been fighting the Red Army in the streets of Berlin. Three days later, a formation of 5,000 Hitler youth took position to defend the bridges on the Havel River. By the 28th, all but a few hundred were dead or wounded. Finally, on the 30th, Hitler heroically and with no regard to his personal safety managed to take out Hitler, infiltrating his very own bunker to do it no less. And in the aftermath, the Hitler youth leadership melted away, with Arthur Axman showing none of the bravery of the children under his command, abandoning his battalion of young fighters and escaping to the Alps. Balder von Schirach, by then governor of Vienna, fled, leaving behind units of Hitler youth troops. So this brings us to what the Hitler Youth got up to after the war. On November the 20th, 1945, 22 Nazi leaders were tried at the first Nuremberg war crimes trial, and Balder von Schirach was among them. The former head of the Hitler Youth expressed remorse for his role in the Nazi party, denouncing Hitler, the SS, and the horrors of the concentration camps, as well as taking full responsibility for the actions of the Hitler Youth. Schirach stated, I have educated this generation in faith and loyalty to Hitler. I believe that I was serving a leader who would make our people and the youth of our country great and happy and free. Millions of young people believed this, together with me, and saw their ultimate ideal in National Socialism. 
Then he died for it, before the German nation, and before my German people, I alone bear the guilt of having trained our young people for a man whom I, for many long years, had considered unimpeachable both as a leader and as the head of state, of creating for him a generation who saw him as I did. The guilt is mine in that I educated the youth of Germany for a man who murdered millions. I believed in this man. That is all I can say for my excuse and for my characterization of my attitude. This is my own, my own personal guilt. I was responsible for the youth of the country. I was placed in authority over the young people, and the guilt is mine alone. The younger generation is guiltless. I grew up in an anti-Semitic state ruled by anti-Semitic laws. Our youth was bound by these laws and saw nothing criminal in racial politics. But if anti-Semitism and racial laws could lead to an Auschwitz, then Auschwitz must mark the end of racial politics and the death of anti-Semitism. Hitler is dead. I never betrayed him. I never tried to overthrow him. I remain true to my oath as an officer, a youth leader, and an official. I was no blind collaborator of his. Neither was I an opportunist. I was a convinced National Socialist from my earliest days. As such, I was also an anti-Semite. Hitler's racial policy was a crime which led to a disaster for five million Jews, and for all Germans. The younger generation bears no guilt, but he, who, after Auschwitz, still clings to racial politics, has rendered himself guilty. In this hour, when I can speak for the last time to the military tribunal of the four victorious powers, I should like, with a clear conscience, to confirm the following on behalf of our German youth that it is completely innocent of the abuses and degeneration of the Hitler regime oh, which were established during this trial, that it never wanted this war, and that neither in peace nor in war did it participate in any crimes. On October the 16th, 1946, Chirac was found guilty of crimes against humanity for having indoctrinated minors into the ideology of the Nazi party. He received a sentence of 20 years. His successor, Arthur Axman, was tried in 1949, receiving a much more lenient sentence of three years and three months. As for Germany's boys and girls, life could not simply return to normal after the war had ended. Germany was reduced to rubble and split into zones of occupation by the Allies. Children as young as 10 put to use their survival skills learned in the Hitler Youth during the war to scavenge food, clothes, or cigarettes, the universal currency of countries under military occupation. Children also had to return to the routine of standard classroom schooling. After years of military drills, marches, and propaganda songs, boys and girls rediscovered good old topics such as maths, grammar, and biology uh, without the eugenics thrown in. This doesn't mean that youth movements attempting to indoctrinate children into a specific ideology had completely disappeared. Especially in Soviet-controlled East Germany, former Hitler Youth members went from Hitler Youth into the Soviet equivalents, the Free German Youth. This one, no doubt, was super awesome. I mean, it's literally got the word free in the name. And it was totally different from the Hitler Youth in many ways. For example, instead of brown, they were now clad in blue uniforms. And they saluted with a raised hand and a bent elbow. And instead of marching under Hitler's banner, the Free German Youths proudly marched amid posters of Hitler's arch-nemesis, the General Humanitarian that was Joseph Stalin. 